for moving down it just with a smaller turnout it just makes for a little um, more intimate conversation it's more fun for the speaker you can feel free to be spaced out and separate that's not a problem just We've had a fair amount of attrition after spring break, so we wish all the people who are not feeling well, good health, get started now. Our, um, this is a room that never made it to uh, daylight savings time, so it's still 5.15 here. But we will track with the real time. Anyway, good evening. Welcome to, I'll take this off. Welcome to Edible Ed 101. It's been a very difficult week in many respects. I think I've been reflecting on just how the world could be so beautiful and so ugly at the same time. I don't know if you've, anybody got outside today? Anybody experienced spring, little spring? Pretty remarkable around here. It's pretty extraordinary. I don't know how it makes, kind of gets under your skin. It makes you feel a certain way. It's, it's really special. These, these early days of spring that we're experiencing are very different than, of course, what the people of Ukraine have been experiencing the last week, which has been just heart-wrenching and uh, tremendous. And I was, I was reflecting on this butterfly behind me um, that landed on this plant called a Centranthus ruber, which just grows like a weed in my garden. And, and then I looked in the New York Times and I saw these crazy photographs that had been released from Ukraine with war crimes. And I was thinking about the butterfly effect. Does anybody know what that is? Has anybody heard of the butterfly effect? Butterfly effect is, anybody want to take a sh shot at it here? The butterfly effect is a, um, is a kind of a theory that comes out of chaos theory that says, um, you know, when a butterfly flaps its wings in South America, it can actually have an impact on a storm thousands and thousands of miles away in a whole nother part of the in the world. So a phenomenon in which a small perturbation in the initial condition of a system results in large changes in later conditions. Such phenomena are common in complex dynamical systems and are studied in chaos theory. And it was originally kind of a mathematical principle that was uh, applied in um, different forms of science and weather study but I was thinking about that with respect to what's happening in the food system, and I sent you a really great podcast this morning. Did anybody get a chance to listen to that yet? So it's just 15 minutes, but it's the New York Times Daily, and it's basically what we've been talking about the last couple weeks, talking about that you know, 80 to 85% of the wheat, which means people's daily bread, um, comes from Ukraine and some from Russia for a lot of Europe and most of the Middle East. I read that 85% um, of all wheat for Egypt comes from Ukraine. The price of wheat in the last year has gone up 61%. So while we might be walking around Berkeley and feeling the pains of some increased prices, um, other parts of the world are going to be feeling this butterfly effect with great severity. And um, I think it's, you know, from a, from a systems thinker moment, it's, um, it, it's a great opportunity to kind of practice this zooming in and zooming out skill that we have to develop. You know, we have to be able to look at the macro, the whole system, and then zoom in and uh, understand the personal, you know, implications. But lots of things are coming up. Um, this is the week everything's kind of coming up roses. <laughs> so I like to think in spring, hope springs eternal. And um, on the bright side for me, I had a couple of really great office hours this week um, that were really fun. 
to, to talk through. People have come to me with questions about their projects and um, their final papers, what they're going to write on. I wanted to just invite a couple people uh, to come up tonight. You want to come up? No? No? You do. You can do it. You can come on up. Tell us. Come on. Just me? Yeah, you. Yeah. Oh. Come, just come right here, because then you can address the massive classroom audience. Let's have a big hand. What, who, what's your name? Hello. Um, I'm Mina. Uh, I'm focusing on like the food education um, in public school systems. Yes, so having more accessible education for like elementary and middle school students. Okay, so tell us your vision. Uh, the vision is so everyone can have like access to learning about like food waste and like hearing from local farmers and stuff like that. Um, I haven't thought too much about it yet, but um, just like in putting curriculum into like everyday public school systems and also like reaching out to local um, farmers or gardeners to like come in and speak to classes and stuff. Good. Thank you. Let's have a big thank you. Evan. Okay. Hey everybody, I'm Evan. Um, so general theme that I'm thinking about is uh, the lack of farmers to grow kind of beyond organic and regenerative produce. I think there's a lot of um, supply or demands uh, on the consumer side for these types of things, but uh, fail rate for entry level farmers is super high. So trying to look at ways to provide pathways um, and on ramps for organic and beyond organic farmers. Example of a pathway. Um, so specifically, I'm looking at why uh, the fail rate is super high for agricultural upstarts. So um, it's like over 80% of farms fail in the first five years. Um, and part of the reason that I'm thinking that is is because uh, farmers need to spend like 25 to 50% of their time on business administration. Um, so I'm looking at models to kind of. Uh, outsource some of that business portion to let farmers focus on growing food. Great. Yeah. Let's talk more about that tomorrow. Yeah, Evan. I feel like, you know, I'm like Jimmy Kimmel now or something. Here. Oh, we can actually talk about my paper. Do you want to talk about it? No, we, I didn't talk about it with any of them. I'm just asking them to share with the rest oh. of the class what you're thinking okay. about. Just Hi. introduce yourself. <laughs> There's also a camera. Hi, I'm Francesca. Um, my paper is more of an abstract idea, so I really need to find a way to get a pathway, which is where I'm struggling. I'll talk to you about this later. Um, but I'm looking at ways to um, how we can decolonize our food systems with um, land rematriation, because that's a really important topic. And we haven't really discussed it much in this class. However, that is a really difficult um, task for someone such as myself or students who go to this university to insert themselves into um, to come up with this so-called solution. So um, trying to find a pathway, um, working with indigenous communities. Um, but yes, pathways are kind of difficult to find right now. Thank you, Francesca. Anybody else want to share? Yeah, one big hand for Francesca for being so brave. Okay, well. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, I thought I should share because... Can you stand up and look Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shachi. I thought my um, idea might be relevant to share because it's connected to Berkeley. Um, as I'm a freshman here, I pretty much rely on the dining hall food to sustain me throughout the day. And I feel like the dining hall food doesn't really offer us options that are nutritious, um, tasty, or even like options for those who are vegan or vegetarian. You want to say that to the camera? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> no, I, that's, thank you. Yeah, yeah and um, I'm still trying to find solutions that are tangible to make a change. But I just think that it is so important because I've noticed that some of the alternatives that I take when I don't want to eat dining hall food is spending a lot of money outside or um, eating like unhealthy snacks such as like instant ramen or just skipping meals, which is terrible. Mm -hmm. And because we are paying for dining hall food, I think this is important. So I'm just like looking to make a change. 
So what, if you could articulate a vision, what might it be? How might you say that um, in a sentence or two? My vision is for students to not have to worry about their next meal, especially when they are paying for a dining hall plan. My vision is for students to, I guess, look forward to the dining hall and not feel like a sense of dread when, like I have felt so often. Did you hear the difference between those two statements? The first one was kind of a negative and the second one was a positive. So she said, you said like, I, I want them to look forward to it. That, that expression of aspiration is something that usually will attract other people to follow you. So when you think about articulating your vision, Think about doing it in the most compelling, aspirational way and believable way, like you did, and you'll find that you'll draw people to your vision. Okay? That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> one other suggestion is don't feel like you have to be limited to one pathway. Um, you can speculate, um, hypothesize about multiple pathways. So. I don't know if you remember, I'm having a hard time remembering, but early in the class, I think we were still on Zoom. Is this on now? Is this working? Can you hear me? Um, I taught you about the creative tension model, this idea that we have a vision up here, and then we have a current reality down here, the way it is. So you have an aspiration, you have a vision that the food in the dining halls will be something you look forward to that's delicious, nutritious, ideally even sustainable, the current reality is right now it's not, right? So there's a lot of creative tension between the vision that you imagine up here and the current reality down here. And then in between, how do you move from the current reality toward the vision? Those are the pathways. So that's kind of a nice framework and I think that was also articulated um, that's written about a lot in a book called The Fifth Discipline, The Creative Tension Model, if you're interested in that. It's one of the key kind of uh, tools that learning organizations use. So when you're framing your paper, if you're struggling at all, the idea of thinking about expressing an aspirational vision, capturing the current reality, and then delineating the pathways to move from where you are to where you want to be. That's kind of the way you write a strategic plan or a recommendation, but I just want to offer that as a possible um, approach for your paper. It doesn't have to be, but that's worked well in this kind of entrepreneurial environment. Okay, um, let's see. Is Kimia here tonight? Is Kimia? You're way up, why are you way up there? You're charging your phone. Well, come down here because um, I had a nice office hour with Kimia this week. And um, out of appreciation for that, I brought her a copy of my book, which is The Republic of Tea, How an Idea Becomes a Business. And I promised you that I would loan it to you. So Thank here you go. You so and when you're done with it, if somebody else wants to borrow it, you're welcome to it. But The Republic of Tea, book was the first, this was a book that actually first came out in 1992. Can you believe that? 30 years ago. This was the first book that really articulated how an early stage business might operationalize its values in the marketplace. And it was written as a complete accident, this book. It was basically a series of faxes that I exchanged with my mentor. Did anybody know what a fax is? Yeah, so um, I met a guy at a conference and we got on an airplane. I'll tell you the story sometime, maybe the last week. But anyway, the letters, we, we generated like 600 pages of letters in about six weeks, just back and forth. It was, we were just like carried away by this idea. And then um, a, got, we shared these letters with a friend and he said, wow, these letters should be a book about how to start a business. And anyway, then it's a long story. It took me two more years to, to get the business started. But the book, the book, the advance from the book provided the capital for the business. And then the rest was kind of history. So um, it's still in circulation. And if you're interested, if you have any dreams of starting a business with a mission, it's a great um, 
it's a great read, and it's all true. And you get to meet me when I was 28, so that was a long time ago. Um, tonight, we have a special uh, presentation, and I'm going to let Sonia Salman, our uh, graduate student instructor for the course, lead the rest of the course. This course is so unusual because it's really a team effort, and it's co-created. Every year, it's co-created differently. The syllabus changes, the speakers change, the theme changes. And tonight, we had expected a different speaker who we had invited many months ago, and at the last minute, Sam Polk from Every Table couldn't make it. But Sonia was very resourceful, and she had been tracking a company called Chef. She had brought it up to me last year in Food Innovation Studio that it really intrigued her as a model for um, entrepreneurial generation and access and lots of other um, really neat um, innovations. So I'm going to let Sonia kind of host the rest of the class tonight. So give her a big round of support. <laughs> and she will introduce our guest. Oh, you're all wired yeah, up too. I am, I okay, am. good. So Take good. it away, Sonia. Cool. So before we play the video, I, I wanted to introduce Chef and our guest speaker, Joy, who I'm super excited for you guys to hear from today. Um, so Chef, as I understand it, and then Joy, you can correct me if I've not pitched it correctly, but is an online marketplace that connects local chefs who are typically people of color and women um, who are cooking cuisines from where they're locally from, from all over the world, and you can get really kind of regionally specific dishes that like only, you could really only find if you went to that part of the world on this platform, and it connects it to consumers like us who are looking to eat authentic homemade food at an affordable price. Um, and I was really intrigued by the idea of chef because that's kind of how I made it through college. I couldn't afford eating out very often, and when I did it, it kind of made me sick. Um, and so my mom would text the sort of fairy network of aunties in the Pakistani community and ask, you know, do you know anyone who could sort of make food for Sanya? And I'd freeze it and send it with her to college. Um, and so I was really intrigued by this idea, and I was like, why isn't there any sort of formalized way of doing this? And then that's how I found Chef. Um, so I wanted to sort of introduce Joey, who is a co-founder, co-CEO, and a serial sort of food entrepreneur who's going to talk to us about Chef. And later we'll have a treat um, of having actually one of the chefs who works on this platform also kind of come speak and share about their experience. Um, so I want to introduce Joey, and then there's a short video I think we'll play as well. So we'll start with the video, and then Joey, feel free to come up. I learned how to cook from my grandmother and my mother. My mom taught me how to cook. Cooking is a part of my life from the time I was born. We've got generations and generations of recipes that have been handed down. Recipes that you really can't find in any restaurant. The taste, the flavor profile you find in this is, is, is another level. I wanted to thank all my customers because you believe in my food. So I want to give 100% to, to you. I really want them to feel like their grandma was in their kitchen. I cook with a lot of love, so that's what you're getting. My name is Amy. My name is Judy. My name is Aruna. My name is Chaganya. My name is Tom. I am Rani. And I'm part of the chef. <laughs> I learned good cool um, I'll just uh, introduce myself and, and maybe give us some background on um, you know, how Chef came to be and, and why it's important for us and, and the mission behind the company. And then I think we're going to do some Q&A later, right? Uh, OK, cool. Um, so the reason we started Chef was actually for one simple reason. And it was, it was uh, to help people like our parents. That was, that was the sole reason. So both Alva and I are the sons of immigrants and small business owners who came to the US to build a better life for their future families. And um, they did exactly that, and, but it wasn't an easy path, and I'm sure you, you may know people or your parents you know, followed a similar path. 
And I think as kids, we, we wish we can help them. We wish we could do, we wish we can help them in their journey. And we did whatever we could. You know, Alvin's parents actually tried to start a restaurant. He was working in the back of the kitchen. Um, my dad started a delivery company um, when he came to the US and I was a driver as soon as I got my driver's license in, in high school. Um, but there's only so much we can do. And I think ever since then, we've had this deep-seated desire to help people like our parents. And, and our hope in starting Chef is that we can help the next generation of families transition to the US and help them build a better life for their future families um, by enabling them to share their food. Um, and I'm sure as many can attest, um, our mother's and our grandmother's food is some of the best food in the world, um, far better than some of the restaurants out there. And if they had the opportunity to share it with others, it could be life-changing for them, especially for people like our parents. You know, my parents came here not knowing the language, um, I'm, I'm very grateful to be a first-generation um, college graduate. I went to UCLA, so go UC. Um, but our parents didn't have that opportunity, and so they really need to find a way to make ends meet. Um, in terms of why food, um, I grew up in an Italian household. My family came here from Sicily, so as you can imagine, food was a big part of my upbringing. Um, and regardless of what was happening in the home, the best part of every day was sitting around the dinner table with your family and having a home-cooked meal. Um, many ways I took that for granted, and I say that my journey in food really began when I went to college. Because when I went off and went to UCLA, I realized I had no idea how to cook. So I went from eating amazing homemade food every day to eating packaged food, fast food, whatever I could afford as a college kid. And as you can imagine, that caught up to me. And by my sophomore year in college, I ended up being hospitalized uh, multiple times uh, with chest pains and migraines that were leaving me unable to walk or see clearly. And doctors said I was having internal bleeding and aneurysms. They did a spinal tap and all these different tests. And after about six months, I finally met with a dietitian who just asked me what my routine is like and what I'm eating. And we realized very quickly it was being caused by my diet. I was diagnosed with high blood pressure when I was 19. And I was told by the doctor I need to stop eating fast food and packaged food, and I need to start making my own food at home. And having no idea how to cook, I just started making these energy bars out of oats and, and nuts and dried fruit. And uh, to be honest, they're pretty horrible at first, and tasted like cardboard. Uh, but with a little help from my mom, and, and my brother was my taste tester, I got pretty good at it. And I basically lived off these, these energy bars through, through UCLA. Um, fast forward, and uh, at their school, I, I went and worked at Facebook and, and had learned a lot there. But about six months after I went and started my career, my, my mother passed away unexpectedly. And for me, that was a turning point. I think we all have these turning points in our lives where you reevaluate um, the impact you want to make. You know, you have limited time here on Earth, and, and what do you want, how do you want to spend that time, and what is the impact you want to, want to have? And for me, I realized that it was, it was food. And I realized that food was not just a big part of our culture and our identity, but I now realize it's a big part of our health and well-being. And so I decided to start my first food company exactly one year for my mom's passing on the anniversary of her passing in September 2011. And it was a very simple concept. We would take these homemade energy bars I'd made at home, and for every bar we sold, we would feed a child in need. And we partnered with the World Food Program, the United Nations, and others to do this. Um, and uh, I learned a lot about the food system. I, we didn't have amazing classes like this when I went to college, but I learned a lot just by doing. And I ran that company for almost seven years. And I think it was at this point I really realized how difficult it was to become a food entrepreneur and just how messed up the food system was, frankly. Um, I ran that company for nearly seven years. We were never able to turn a profit. Um, I was never able to pay myself. I often joke that my 20s looked a lot different than most people. I didn't have a salary for seven years. And uh, by the last year of business, I was actually living in the storage room of our warehouse where we made our products um, and showering at the gym before our employees would get in um, each morning. And the, the reality is I'm one of the lucky ones. Most people will never have the opportunity to share their food or start a food business or a restaurant. The average cost to start a restaurant in the US is, is $300,000, and, and it's actually more in California. And so imagine you're someone like my mother or my grandmother who makes incredible food. They're, they're never going to have the opportunity to share their food, um, especially if they come from immigrant or refugee backgrounds where access to credit or capital is even more constrained. And so for me, after that venture, you know, the idea for Chef was, was really a no-brainer. The best, the best food in the world is being prepared by people who will never have the opportunity to share it with others. It's being prepared by people like our mothers and our grandmothers and if we can just allow them access, allow them the opportunity to share that food, it would mean, you know, it can change their lives. 
Um, and we really started the com company with two, two purposes. One, um, which resonates with me personally, which is that we believe everyone should have access to a homemade meal and, and a high quality affordable meal. And secondly, that anyone should be able to share their food with others and be able to feed their neighbors. And you know, the funny part is this is not a new idea, right? For millennia, people fed their neighbors. It's only a novel thing that if you want to feed yourself, you either have to eat at a restaurant or prepare your own meals. And so this idea that we can build community around food, I think, is very exciting for us. You know, we started this company, and our mission was to build this global community devoted to economic empowerment and cultural inclusivity by enabling anyone to feed their neighbor. Um, but over time, what we've realized is that food is, is also just a common language that can bring us closer together. And as you alluded to, there's, like, there's aunties on the platform. I, I never tried Pakistani food until I ordered from Aisha on the platform. And I, Shireen is my other, I, I never had Egyptian food until I ordered from Shireen. And so I've learned about different cultures through food. Um, and so more and more, the vision for the company is becoming, you know, as people start to use a platform who are not from immigrant and expat, expat backgrounds, that we can actually connect people through food. And in a time where we're so disconnected as a world and as a, as, a, as a country, we can actually bring people together with a common language that we all speak. And so um, that's our hope for Chef. Um, we're still at the beginning. We started the company about three years ago. Um, but our hope is that we can bring people closer together and around the table. Cool. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can maybe start some of the Q&A, and then I know that there's going to be a chef who's going to join us. Yeah. So I would love to also hear from her, and maybe you guys can have a bit of dialogue when she gets here. Does that sound Yeah, good? that'd be awesome. Okay, let's, let's do have it. a seat. Cool, all right. Well, cool. Um, and also, part of the, this part of the section is like when students can come down, line up, and ask questions. Um, but I'll kind of kick us off. There's, there's so much I want to know about Chef. Um, but I think to start with, what would be really helpful is to know a bit more about the business model. So hmm. right now, um, you mentioned sort of starting your first company. You were never able to turn a profit. And mm -hmm. sometimes when we think about, you know, we've talked in class about kind of blitz scaling and the way that kind of tech Silicon Valley works. And there's not really a focus on building a sustainable business. Yeah. So when you sort of think about that in terms of how you're building Chef and sort of the cut that chefs actually get and how you're thinking about profitability versus scale and quality and those trade-offs, um, what sort of comes to mind for you and what can you share? Yeah, so when we started the company, we... we um, Alvin and I always said we need to do two things really well. We need to make these entrepreneurs very successful, um, and we need to, we always say that, you know, our, we're not trying to build a, a successful company, we're trying to help millions of others do it, and if we can do that, then we'll win. Um, and the second thing is to ensure that every meal is safe and high quality, right? Because this is a, a new avenue for getting food, and if we're gonna normalize this way of eating, then we need to ensure it's safe, right? Um, and so we've gone through great lengths, and although you, know, you log onto the platform and it seems very simplistic in theory, right? You, you put in your zip code and you see all the amazing cooks cooking in your area, there's a lot of magic that happens behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I would say the biggest thing is that when you apply on the platform, it's not that you simply apply and you throw up your photos and you start <laughs> selling your food, right? Um, there's actually a 150-step onboarding process that our onboarding team and then our account management team helps these chefs with. As you can imagine, the majority of people who cooking, are cooking on the platform um, have never sold food for money in their life, right? So when it comes to uh, portion sizing, pricing, um, photography, everything, they don't know what to do. And so we're not only helping during that you know, 150 step onboarding process ensure high quality, safe meals. We have safety trainings and certifications and other things. But we also help you with your menu formulation, your photography, um, your descriptions, your bio, your headshots, everything you need to start the business. And, and by the way, we ensure that none of this costs anything to you, right? So you are starting on the platform at no cost. But the reality is, you know, it, it is very intimidating for someone who is, you know, a, a grandmother to start selling their food. And so we really need to help them through the process. And we do that literally one by one. Yeah. Um, we have an incredible onboarding team that works directly with those folks. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, I know last semester, sort of, when I was thinking about this problem a lot, as Will sort of alluded to it, in a class called Food Innovation Studio, I had sort of looked at this model before I had sort of known that Chef existed. 
And I was sort of really intrigued by the fact that, kind of like you said, people have been feeding their neighbors sort of informally forever. And there's lots of other kind of informal, Sammy legal sort of platforms. People are using like Facebook Marketplace and things like that, but there's not a lot of formalized ways in which you can do that. So yeah. could you speak a little bit to, I think a lot of the work that you all have done that's pretty amazing, and I think this comes from Alvin, the other co-founder's background, mm -hmm. is you've understood the regulatory landscape and how that's sort of changing and COVID sort of precipitated some of that as well. So could you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Also because I know there was a startup, Josephine, that tried this, yeah. and, and I think they were in the Bay, and they were not able to be super successful because I think it wasn't the right timing. Yeah. Um, so can you sort of speak about that and how that's changing and what your team is sort of doing to preemptively think about that? Yeah, um, and, th and this is also part of our founding story a little bit. I mean, first of all, I'll say, we wouldn't be here without the companies that came before us, and that is without a doubt, right? And so when I first had this idea back in 2017, I, I did look into it, and I saw the companies like Josephine's, and I was like, oh, well, this is, this is illegal. Like, yeah. um, my mother can feed her family, but it's actually illegal for her to feed her neighbors. And so I wrote off the idea until I met my co-founder, Alvin, and Alvin and I actually met in Israel on a social impact program. And you know, this program was you know, very emotional. Him and I just became very close. And at the time, he was working in the White House. So Alvin uh, was a senior tech advisor for Obama, and then um, he started Code.gov under Obama, and at the time, um, I knew he was going to leave the new administration, and so a few months later, I went to go visit him in D.C., honestly, just to get a tour of the White House, because I had never been there before. And uh, reason. <laughs> yeah, and when I walked into his apartment, um, he had this idea for Chef on his whiteboard, and I was like, you know, Alvin, I had the same idea. I looked into it. It's actually illegal, and Alvin was the first one who told me that it was actually going to become legal in the state of California, um, hopefully in a few months. And... And so that's when we decided that we were going to work on this together. We actually filmed our, our video for Y Combinator that weekend and ended up getting to Y Combinator a few months later. Um, and the, the folks that were working on it, Alvin was one of those folks working on it for, um, with the, the founders of Josephine. So the founders of Josephine, they, um, after the business failed because of regulatory constraints, they started a nonprofit called the Cook Alliance. And the Cook Alliance lobbies for um, regulations so that home cooks can, can cook. And so, um, we're actually, we work very closely with the Cook Alliance now and the founders of Josephine's, um, and, and we definitely wouldn't be here without them. Now, I think when we started the company, it was, you know, just in California, and our mission really was to empower people like our parents, you know, immigrants and refugees. Um, but when the pandemic hit, as you can imagine, every, everything changed, right? Overnight, um, the number of applicants applying to our platform, 10x, it quickly grew to, we had an 8,000-person waiting list. We now have over 30,000 people who have applied to be on the platform. Um, and it wasn't just um, in, in California. And so we actually put everything on hold. Um, this is the reason why we have people ask us, why haven't you had an app for three years? It's because we put everything on hold and said, we just need to be there for as many people as we can. Mm -hmm. I flew out to New York in June of 2020 during the pandemic. We launched in New York. And, and you saw this firsthand. You know, we had Michelin star chefs who had been furloughed indefinitely cooking. We had Broadway actresses cooking and bartenders cooking. People across the service industry who had lost their access to income overnight. And um, these stories were just, you know, I, I think the most impactful thing and the thing that we think about all the time. I mean, the, 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 the Broadway actress told us it was the first haircut she was able to get that year because she was cooking on the platform. Mm. We had another woman in Seattle who, when I got to the Airbnb with the launching team, was crying, saying that um, the earnings that she was able to make during the first week on, on the platform um, were able to pay her rent because she was about to be evicted in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And we heard the same in Chicago. And, and so it, it was very clear that this was, and, and, as, and, and as you alluded to, this was not just happening on our platform. When the pandemic happened, you, you started to see people selling their food on Instagram, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace. Um, and, and I think that's how, that's the big shift we've had in the regulatory discussion over the past few years. I think lawmakers at this point have realized that the train has left the station, right? Mm -hmm. It's happening. You, can't, you can no longer ignore it. Mm -hmm. uh, before the pandemic, it was happening in small pockets. Immigrant communities were using WhatsApp and WeChat and other, <laughs> yes. other platforms, as you know. Yeah. Um, but now you can just log on to Facebook and you can see it happening. And yeah. so, our, our priority right now is to work with lawmakers to ensure that they're implementing laws in, in a way that's safe, right? Mm -hmm. Like we've, we've now delivered over 200, 2 million meals 
and we, we've learned a lot, and we can, we can help guide those, those laws so that we can make sure it's being done safely. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. What, um, so two, two sort of follow-ups to that. What do you think has been the big resistance? Has it been from a food safety perspective, or is there something more that's going on? Is there restaurants that don't want this to happen, or what's sort of going on in terms of what was the resistance to this? And then um, I'd love to know how, did, how have chefs heard about Chef? You know, how do they yeah. learn to get onto the platform? Um, I remember last semester I talked to a lot of folks who were cooking sort of informally, but were cooking for others. Yeah. And I mentioned Chef to them, and they got super excited about it. Yeah. But uh, I, I want to hear personally about how chefs find out and, and get onboarded. Yeah, definitely. So on the resistance side, there actually has not been a ton of resistance, to be honest. Um, mm. and, and I think the reason for that is that we're very clear in our intentions. And, and I think everyone, lawmakers want to provide more economic opportunity for their constituents, especially during the pandemic. The biggest thing that I think folks have been concerned about is the safety portion, right? Like, is this safe? Yeah. And I think we've now shown that you know, after you know, delivering 2 million meals safely, that this can be done safely. Um, and also, it, it kind of makes sense if you think about it. I don't know if you've been in many commercial kitchens, which we partner with commercial kitchens in areas where it's not legal yet, and we provide them for our chefs to use. Um, but if you've been into these commercial kitchens or commissaries or some even restaurant kitchens, they're not always so clean and sanitary, especially when they're uh, hourly kitchens where no one feels a responsibility to clean up after they use it. Whereas if you've been to my mother's and my grandmother's kitchen, you know like they're feeding their family out of this kitchen, so they have an obligation to keep it clean. And so it kind of makes sense, but I think there's a weirdness and a stigma behind it that I think mm. people are now getting over. Um, but I think it, it really goes back to the data. Like now we can actually show, because mm. California led the way, that this ca actually can be done safely. And we've also learned that California could have done more too. Like we actually implemented additional um, safety uh, training on our end that mm -hmm. I think helped a lot. And so in these new laws, we're hoping to show that there, there's, there's specific training you can implement to make sure that it's being done safely. Um, on how people hear about us, it, it's, it's funny, it's, it's mainly word of mouth. We don't really do much marketing on the, on the chef side. Yeah. It's mostly that people. That means it's good. Yeah. <laughs> that means people yeah. like it. <laughs> it. I mean, someone will order and they're like, hey, my mother, my grandmother, my aunt's also a good cook. I'm going to tell them about it. Yeah. And, um, and most of it's word of mouth on the, on the supply side. So um, if you know any amazing chefs, you should tell them <laughs> um, to share their food and their gift with others. And for many people, this is. I mean, it is their love language, right? Yeah. And so when they hear about it, for some people it's about you know, access to the economic opportunity. For other people, like my grandmother was a fir technically the first person to cook <laughs> on the platform. Um, she That's cooked cool. her banana bread for a YC interview. Um, and we joke we got into Y Combinator because they were eating her banana bread while they're interviewing us. Um, and, but you know, for her, you know, she, she got really into it too. Yeah. We told her that we're gonna take her banana bread. She made like 20 different loaves, some were with margarine, some were with butter, yeah. and she had Alvin and I try it, and she's like, which one's better? And we're like, grandma, they're all amazing. Yeah. <laughs> we can't tell the difference, they're all good. Totally. Um, but for her, it's not about the income, it's more about giving, um, giving her a sense of pride and something yeah. to do, right? Because um, she's retired now. So yeah. for a lot of people, it's, it's word of mouth and they just hear about that. Yeah, one. that's yeah. so beautiful. I always think about when we talk about food, we had um, the CEO of Good Eggs come mm. a few weeks back and he'd sort of talked about like food should be sold by people who care about food. You know, we were sort of talking about the Amazonification of groceries and things like yeah. that. And I, I think it's just such an important reminder that food is so much more than just function. It's, yeah. it, it's moments of celebration. It means things to people. It, it's, it evokes memories. It's, it's such a special sort of um, love language, like you said. Yeah. And for me, that's particularly relevant right now during uh, the month of Ramadan for Muslims when we're fasting, because iftar becomes this moment of gathering for us, because you're hungry the whole day, and yeah. you're cranky. And then the moment of iftar is when you come together typically with community and you eat something. And there are foods that remind me specifically of iftar. Yeah. And when I went to college, I couldn't access those foods. Mm -hmm. And so I would have loved to have something like Chef back then because yeah. I would have, my friends would have, and I would have gone crazy to have pakore and you know, these other things that are so specific to that moment of our life in that year. Yeah. Um, so it's 
So I, that really resonates with me, and that's super exciting. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to ask also a question about, I know you all, because you're very focused on your mission, have done a lot to sort of think about chef in the moment of sort of these world crises that have been seemingly unending but that have been happening. So um, when we sort of pulled out of Afghanistan and sort of what that happened, what that sort of precipitated in terms of uh, refugees coming to America and now with Ukraine. Um, and so I know that chef was doing some work around that. So because it's sort of timely, Will had brought it up earlier, mm -hmm. would love to sort of hear how you sort of approach that and what your mindset was. Yeah. Um, again, I think we can relate. These are people like our, our parents, and this is why we started the company. So when something like this is happening and we can do anything to help, we're going to do it. Um, and so, yeah, with, um, with the refugees from Afghanistan, we, we try to get in touch with all the local um, agencies that were working with them. And we basically sponsor them when they're ready. For, at first, we realized that, hey, they weren't actually ready to cook on the platform and share their food. All they need, they need access to food. And so we have, um, we have chefs cooking authentic uh, food from Afghanistan on the platform. So we, we opened up donations, and we actually um, had authentic meals made as they resettled. Um, and now that they're resettled, we are funding their business. We're buying, buying them cooking supplies, everything they need to get started, um, and also giving them marketing dollars and everything they need to, to get orders and helping them get you know, a small business up and running as they, as they resettle here. Um, and we're ready to do the same for any refugees you know, that, that need access. But again, like for us, um, this really comes down to empowering people through, through food. Yeah. And they, these are incredible cooks in many cases, right? Yeah. So if we can either help them, help feed them, or we can help provide economic opportunity through their incredible food, then we're going to do it. And, and yeah, we did that with, with the Afghan crisis as well as um, Ukraine now. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I also want to encourage if there's any students to come. I know I've been asking a lot of questions, but if you do have questions, feel free to line up or raise your hand and just kind of flag me down so that I, I don't miss it. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I have a question around sort of the ambitions of Chef. I know you're young and you're sort of still, I'm sure there's lots of things you're, you're sorting out, but um, as you think of like kind of your dream goal and ambition with Chef, how do you define that? And I ask that because I'm curious about the sort of application of Chef feels very like there's a lot of opportunity. It feels very kind of bright, and <laughs> the opportunity of where you could apply Chef. Yeah. It's more than just individual consumers. To me, we had somebody talking about um, Berkeley dining, right? Uh, there's, there's school lunches. There's you know, what people eat in offices, especially when they're working crazy hours. There's lots of use cases for something like what Chef is doing. Yeah. And I'm curious. I mean, obviously, I know when you're like first starting a company, you're really focused on just getting things yeah. going day to day. But as you think of the really kind of wild and crazy ambitious dream, what is that for Chef? It's funny. I think people ask this a lot, even candidates. are like, what, what's your mm -hmm. vision in five years? And um, it's, not, it's not too much different than what we're doing now, right? I always say, so I remember one of our, one of our first three chefs, her name was Sapriya, and she was cooking um, South Indian food. And... Um, she, within her first month or two, was making $2,000 a day on the platform. And so we brought her in our office and we we're like, we want to learn from you. Like, how were you able to do this? And, um, you know, we learned a lot, but she, she cried during that, that um, interaction. She said, you know, I, I moved from India from four, four years ago, so her husband can be an engineer in, in the Bay Area. And she worked back in India, but she hasn't been able to work since she moved here because she has two young daughters at home that she needs to care for. And, um, and so for her, she was able to pay off all of their debt that they accumulated coming here. Okay. They were able to visit India for the first time um, in four years. And, and more than anything, I think she felt like she can contribute something to the household, and that was really meaningful for her. Yeah. And um, it's still like my, my profile picture on Slack is still me and Sapria, and like this yeah. was, you know, I mean, it was a special moment for us. And I think it was a moment where we realized, like, this is something. Yeah. Like, we built something that actually helped someone. Yeah. And I often say that, like, if we can just recreate that story a million times, yeah. that's enough. You know, that we don't need to go build a stadium somewhere or do anything else. Like, sure. all we need to do is, is continue to recreate that. And there's a ton more we can do. I mean, right now, 
we are building in on, you know, right now it's a simple platform, but there's a lot in the back end we're doing. So we're building in the ability to access microfinancing, faster payouts, health insurance, um, access to credit um, and capital to build your business, mm -hmm. all on the back end for chefs. And so there's a ton more that we can be doing. I mean, we have, re we have you know, partnerships with Restaurant Depot, mm -hmm. so they get discounted products and other things too. Um, and there's a ton more we can continue doing, but you know, I think that the, the, the mission, the vision is still the same. I would say the only other thing is like, ultimately we want anyone to have you know, the access and to become a food entrepreneur if they want to, enable anyone to share their food. And I think the world that we see is a world in which people are fed and people are feeding their neighbors. And, and again, this is not a novel idea. People did this for millennia before, <laughs> before now, right? And so, but like how cool would that be? I mean, you know, if you're in an urban area and you're using DoorDash, like, you know, it's, and I often say we're, we're kind of the antithesis of most, most tech companies. I yeah. think most tech companies are creating more separation and isolation in the food system, and we're trying to bring real people closer together. Yeah. Um, and, but when I, I was living in Vallejo for the past mm -hmm. year, and in Vallejo, when you go on DoorDash, all you see is fast food, yeah. right? But, but Vallejo is like one third Asian American. Yeah. It's a very diverse place. There's amazing food being cooked all around you that you don't have access to. Mm -hmm. And you smell it. I was like, you know, <laughs> walk through the apartment building, you smell it being That's cooked. That's the best part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm like, why can't I just knock on my neighbor's door yeah. and order? Do you have any extra? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess now, you know, if yeah. they join Chef, we could. Um, but I think the future we see is that. And I think that, you know, one, yes, it provides opportunity for a lot of folks. But, but two, I think it will bring people closer together. Yeah. Um, and food can be this universal language that connects people. Yeah, I love that. And that's yeah. such a beautiful and kind of humble, um, such a different approach than I feel like a lot of Silicon Valley takes. And I think it circles back to my initial question around how do you build a sustainable business, one that actually is going to last and is going to do so in a way that is not, it's disruptive, but not in a way that comes at a cost of mm -hmm. you know, humans. Yeah. So I think that's, that's really great. I think we have a question which I'm so glad to take, but I think our chef is also here and was giving me a call oh. while we were chatting. So um, why don't we do this? I've been asked your question, and then I might actually take myself off the of mic and, and call the chef back. Cool. And then we'll go on break for about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll have a chat with the chef. Does that sound Sounds good? Sounds good. Cool. Right. Yeah, it's actually just a follow-up to that. I love the uh, mission-driven approach, and I'm wondering how specifically you kind of uh, do your compensation structure for the chefs to make sure that you're not like ultimately becoming extractive. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think the, the most important thing with, um, and we operate very similar to any other marketplace, uh, so that everyone knows, you know, if you go on Airbnb and you see you're booking a place and then there's, there's fees that you're paying to book that place, it's very similar on Chef. And so what we do for, for both sides of the marketplace is we're just very transparent about what those fees are and what they're used for. And so we literally break out, this is a cost for delivery, this is a cost for the operations, um, and anything else we're providing. And ultimately, the biggest thing that, that we do is just we put the power in their hands to say, these are the recommended portion sizes and pricings. Ultimately, you control your menu. You can do whatever you want. And, and this is very counter to, I think, a lot of marketplaces that have commoditized their supply. And when you commoditize your supply, um, it really suppresses their voice and ultimately, you know, you think Uber and Lyft, right? It's like they commoditize their supply. Um, every note of supply is the same. And, and because of that, there's no real voice on their marketplace. Um, I don't think Airbnb has done it perfectly, but I think Airbnb has at least done a better job at being host first. Um, and so everything, again, that we do, we always say that internally, like chefs are the North Star. And everything that we do needs to be done through the lens of the chef. It's, if it's not in the best interest of the chef, we shouldn't be building it. Um, and so right now what we do is, yeah, there is, there is a take rate. What, we're, what we do is just we make sure it's very transparent and that you're still making money. And also building in tools for it. We're actually building in like a recipe automation tool now so that whenever you get your orders, you can actually see what are your food costs. Because this is the, one of the biggest things in, in the restaurant industry. If, I don't know if you've ever worked in a restaurant before, but like, Restaurantpreneurs and food entrepreneurs have a very difficult time ensuring they make money just because there's no great tools out there from the, for them to predict um, what food costs are going to be for that day. And, and also, they overbuy and underbuy different ingredients. Um, 
Everything that we do at Chef is built through the lens of the Chef. So for example, you'll notice that we don't do on-demand delivery. We don't do on-demand or hot food delivery. That's because we tried it in the beginning during Y Combinator, and we found it was a nightmare for the chefs. If you can imagine, it's difficult enough for a restaurant to do on-demand hot food orders. If you're a mother with children running around at 6 p.m., it's nearly impossible. And on top of that, for you to, do, to accurately predict what your food costs and what you should buy at the store is, you, there's no way. And so on our platform, you'll notice that every meal is purchased um, usually two days ahead of time. You can, they can send it to the day before. So everything's pre-purchased. They go out and buy their ingredients before they cook. They batch cook everything. So the effective hourly wage on our platform is over $40 an hour because they batch cook everything at once. They cool it and it's delivered cold, which is much easier for them to do. And so, again, I think the biggest thing, there's a million decisions you make every year. And, and you just have to look at every decision through the lens of the chef, ultimately. This is so great. Yeah. There's not even any non-fungible tokens involved yet. <laughs> Did you see that, that Howard Schultz announced today that Starbucks was getting into the NFT no. business before the end of the year? No. So that's a whole nother story. Let's take a 10 minute break, uh, stretch, uh, use the restroom if you need it. Even take the time to share your vision and values and pathways with your neighbor. And we'll come back and continue the conversation with Joey and one of the chefs. Attention, coming back from break. All right, so hopefully everyone got a chance to stretch and use the restroom, whatever you needed to do. Um, I feel like a student, <laughs> you know, um, but this is the best we've got. So um, I am super excited to have a chef from the Chef Platform uh, actually join us. Uh, in the flesh and sort of share about her experience. Um, so Joey, I don't know if you want to introduce Yogita. And then Yogita, I would love to hear to start off with um, a bit about your story of how, kind of what you were just telling me actually, about how you came upon Chef and the sort of career switch you had to make and what that experience has been like so far. But I'll let Joey do an intro first. Yeah, I won't spoil the story, um, <laughs> but this, this is Chef Yogita. Um, I think it's, it's an honor to have her here. It's very rare that we get to see our chefs, and Yogita is um, a rock star, um, <laughs> dancer and cook, um, which I'll let, I'll let her tell her own story. <laughs> but um, yeah, Yogita. Yeah. So. Thank you. Um, so yeah, as you said, my name is Yogita Kulkarni. Um, I'm from India, basically. Um, I'm here for 10 years. I am trained Bharatnatyam dancer. That's um, an Indian classical dance style. I was working in the dance field two years, until two years back when we had a shelter in place order. And um, I was just telling them that I was in um, Cal State East Bay taking a workshop, dance workshop, hopeful that um, I'll get some opportunity later in the same field. And we got shelter in place order. Opportunity started, uh, you know, going down. So I came across a chef uh, kind of advertisement on Facebook. And um, as I am cooking, uh, I cook every day for my family. Um, it somehow triggered that people who are here, away from home, uh, away from their family, they miss, somehow they miss the home cooked meal. And that um, idea clicked and I connected through Chef to many of the customers. I started cooking on Chef and it was a great opportunity I have ever had um, until now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, 
so I want this to sort of be a dialogue. So Joe, if you have questions or you have questions, you know, for us, we'll sort of um, have it sort of be that way. And then again, I, I keep turning to the audience because I'm very focused here. But if if you guys have questions, again, flag me down, come to the mic, take the mic. Um, we want this to be a conversation. Um, so Joey, I don't know if you have a question, but I have questions for you. No, <laughs> yeah, go for it. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so you sort of mentioned it's been one of the greatest opportunities you've had. Um, can you talk a little bit about, so before you came, Joey was talking about how one of their missions for Chef is to help chefs like yourself become kind of small business owners. Um, and I'm imagining, as a dancer, you maybe <laughs> were not as familiar with that sort of owning a small business aspect of things. So can you talk a little bit about what that process was like for you, sort of learning about how to market yourself and what to put on your menu and what to cook? Um, what was that process like? All right. So the first thing was uh, tasting. Uh, I cooked some dishes and um, sent it for tasting and got back the result that um, it's good to go on the pro to, <laughs> good to put on profile. <laughs> So um, my goal was to put uh, typical Maharashtrian dishes, which are, Maharashtra is a state in India, it's a western state, where Mumbai is. And uh, me and my husband, we are both from Mumbai. So we used to love that street food, the home cooked meal, and um, I was particular on putting the same uh, dishes on my menu because uh, when pandemic started especially, uh, I could see many of my friends who have no time to cook for their family. And then one thing I observed when my husband started working from home, my daughter started attending school from home, I realized that, that one meal, uh, one meal of the day, can make your day. <laughs> That's really nice, yeah. If it is, if it is home cooked and uh, particular to your taste, and if you like it, your mood is elevated. It's very much connected to your psychology. So it was my chance <laughs> to go through it. Um, as a performer, I know how the emotions work, how, you're, how you express. So I started uh, writing about uh, the dishes. I started more of the research, where the dish comes from, why is it cooked, in which uh, season, which climate, why was it invented. And then I realized that uh, it was, many of the dishes were wisely invented. Mm. So then the process started of research, putting on the, on the menu on the chef website. Then came an opportunity where a chef helped me to get a micro enterprise home kitchen operation certificate mm -hmm. from uh, Alameda County of uh, Environmental Health Department. The process was very smooth because on, from chef side, the research and um, the projection of that research was so clear that on every step there was someone to help me uh, to get the certificate, to get the uh, application, um, walk me through the process. It was very much clear. And then I got my uh, permit, mm -hmm. and now it is called Yogita's Kitchen. <laughs> so, my well home kitchen <laughs> is certified to cook. It is safe. It is, um, the food is cooked with love, safety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're underselling yourself. It's incredible. <laughs> it's restaurant quality. Yeah. <laughs> In fact. I, I think too, I think uh, we didn't talk too much about the food itself, but I think you bring up a really good point, which is that the food you find on Chef, and you kind of alluded to this, is not the food you're finding on DoorDash or these other platforms, right? These are often recipes that have been passed down through generations, and they're not, you know, not available anywhere else. Right. And, 
And so everyone has that special experience on the platform where they're having food. There's people on our team from Mumbai who, are, who order your food and they say they can't get this anywhere else, right? Um, because usually Indian restaurants have the same food. I believe it's mostly North Indian food. Yeah, Punjabi. Yeah, yeah. and so, and, and people often, like one question people ask is like, what, what's the best experience I've ever had on Chef? And that was, I had a similar moment where my favorite homemade dish is called Brajol. Um, most people have never probably heard of it. It's an Italian dish. It takes a long time to make. Um, and it's basically this giant um, meatball that's wrapped with all this amazing deliciousness inside with like hard boiled eggs and cold cuts and wow. peas. Wow. And they roll it like a sushi wrap. And because of this, it's very difficult to do. And I've never seen it yeah. at a restaurant. And my mom would only make it once a year for the holidays. And this is the reason why I would look forward, you know, to the holidays of every year. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, since my mom passed, we, you know, we don't often get this dish. And um, when we went and expanded to New York, there was a chef from Tuscany. Her name was Jessica with a G. And I learned that she made this dish. And I, I immediately called my dad. And I told my dad that there was a chef in New York that makes Brigitte. Wow. And my dad ended up ordering it for the whole team on the ground when we launched. Yeah. And somewhere out there, there's an embarrassing video of me with tears <laughs> in my eyes eating this dish. But these are the experiences that people yeah. have with Yogita's menu. Yes, when people I'm like you can't positive. find these dishes anywhere yeah. else. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I um, oh, we have questions. I'll finish a thought and then ask um, some folks to come down. Um, I don't know if any of you all watch Ugly Delicious on Netflix, um, but there was an episode I recently watched on India and, f and Indian food. Uh, and the sort of takeaway was how diverse and vast the cuisine is and how we expose people to like 0.5% of what Indian cuisine is. And it's a travesty because there's so much diversity and such good food. Yes. And all we kind of know is like, you know, sag paneer and you know, chicken tikka masala. Mm -hmm. And there's so much more. I mean, in a, in a country that has a billion people, you would think there's that much diversity, and there is. Yeah. But there's no way to find that because you won't find that in restaurants. And you won't certainly find that on DoorDash. But you can find that at Chef, which is pretty mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah. Um, OK, so we had a question. Somebody had their hand up. Yes, come down. and. Introduce yourself and ask your question. Hi, uh, my name is Nikolai. Um, so I actually first heard about Chef like two days ago, actually. <laughs> I was like in the student center, um, just studying. This guy next to me was talking to somebody next to him and talking about Chef. Um, so it's pretty crazy <laughs> that now <laughs> I'm talking to the co-founder. Um, but I had a question that kind of builds off a previous question that was asked about the long-term vision of Chef. Um, it seems like you know, most companies that exist today, like their goal is just to expand and get people on the platform. And you kind of bring up, you brought the example of Airbnb earlier where um, they have a lot of people on their platform. Mm -hmm. And part of the goal of that is it gets the price down for consumers. Mm -hmm. But with the, or it seems like with Chef, um, the goal is to provide a platform for people who would originally not have a platform, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, is there any long-term vision to cap the amount of chefs on your platforms to make sure that it's equitable to everybody on there? Um, or is it kind of like you guys to expand and there's not really a vision for the total amount of chefs you know, to be on the platform at once? Yeah, um, it's a good, good question. It gets into this uh, marketplace equilibrium and, and what that means. I think ultimately, um, I hope we never cap the platform. I think there's a lot of people like Alvin and myself who have no idea how to cook, who, who would order from their neighbors. Um, I don't know what the ratio, like listen, if we, if we actually reach full saturation, like which listen would be incredible if we're across the country and across the world and we're, and we're worried that there's not enough consumers for the, for the supply on the platform. Um, I think what we've, we've found to date is that the more supply we add to the platform, the more demand comes because people are looking for diversity. Um, they're looking to try new things. So we, we have really two core consumers that use the platform. We have folks that um, are immigrants, expats or refugees from the countries that they're ordering from. And they, they want to rediscover a taste of home, um, just like we were talking about. Um, but there's a lot of people who are exploring new things for the first time. And so they're actually really driven by new supply that we add to the platform. And so it's one of the primary reasons that actually new chefs actually tend to do really well on the platform because folks really love the new, new whatever new is added. And we also market all the new supply 
pretty aggressively so that folks do get orders. Um, so I don't know, I, I hope we don't get to a point where we have to turn away chefs on the platform. Um, and I think, there's, I think um, there's a lot of people like myself who unfortunately have no idea how to cook and uh, <laughs> hopefully will order from their neighbors. Amazing. Um, I have a question around, I was sort of prompted by what you just said. Uh, do you, and it's a question for both of you, um, how much sort of consumer education do you have to do? Because these are dishes that are kind of n novel to a lot of people unless you're from that country. And uh, there are those of us who are adventurous eaters and get excited by trying new things, and there are others of us who are not. <laughs> and that's probably what the restaurant industry caters to. Um, so kind of curious from both of your perspectives, from a business, but also from a chef's perspective, how much consumer education do you feel you need to do? Or, or is there a particular way, certain words you have to use, ways that you have to communicate to sort of um, also change the way people are eating? I know you did a lot of research for your menu, so I'll let you <laughs> kick off. So, yeah. Uh, from, uh, like, for the consumers, it's if they are having it for the first time, they look for certain um, tags. Like, my menu is purely vegetarian. Mm. Um, I use pulses, beans, uh, chickpea flour, and uh, vegetables. I use plantain. So I write it in such a way that I am clear with the ingredients, um, clear with the tags, uh, if it's vegan, if it is um, vegetarian but has a dairy. Mm. So I. I don't want anyone to, you know, guess the <laughs> ingredients. Yeah, not a good surprise. If, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that helps while designing a menu or writing a menu. Um, also, uh, allergy advice is because some of the ingredients are, they don't have the ingredients, I mean, the allergens, but are processed on the facility, the same facility. So uh, allergy advice helps. Also, sometimes I try to write a story behind it, like why the dish was invented, mm. where the dish was invented, or if I have learned it from someone. And this story, does it exist kind of on your profile on Chef, or do you sort of send it with the food? How do people learn the story? So a one-line story is um, on the profile, yeah. I mean, with the dish. And also, I send a thank you note, I mean, a note, mm. um, say, sometimes describing a story. Um, there is a dish which I learned from my neighbor, and um, she used to cook it for me when I was a child. So I, that story is kind of interesting that I have grown up with such people. Yeah. So I share it with the consumers, um, trying to make the dish interesting, feeling homely. Yeah and close to your heart. Yeah. <laughs> totally. I think that's exactly it. We, also, we often say at Chef that we are a platform of stories. Mm. And I think that that's the reason why people care, right? So when you go on, th this is a, there, there is a real problem here. Because like, I think for folks, when, they, when you go on DoorDash, you gravitate towards what you know, right? It's like, mm. oh, well, I know, I know Sweet Green, or I know Taco Bell. And so I know what I'm going to get. And it's yeah. a very safe bet. And we need to convince people that you should try Egyptian or Pakistani or West African food. Um, and the only way you can do that is to, to tell them why they should care, right? Mm. So a lot of, whether it's a chef's bio, some chef bios have videos that you can watch mm. of their actual story. Um, but a lot of our marketing, we have general rules about our marketing. Our marketing never appears without chefs in it. Um, it's majority videos like you saw at the beginning here, um, which is, folks telling their own story and why you should care. And I think that allows you to feel connected and allows you to give it a shot. It's the same as if you watch some of these Netflix or like Hulu documentaries on food and like, um, like someone like Padma, who is an investor in our company, yeah. she's telling the story about something. You want to try it. Yeah. Even if you've never had this dish before, like you're hearing the story of this person who's making it and why they're making it and the origins of the story. And you're like, wow, now I want to try it. Yeah. And so. It is difficult for us, but we need to do that at scale. We need to tell stories at scale. Um, I often, um, we, we tell investors this pretty openly, like we, and we got a lot of flack for it. 
both Alvin and I are non-technical co-founders, yeah. um, which Y Combinator does not like, investors don't like. And so they said, okay, that's fine, but the first person you hire needs to be an engineer. And we're like, no, the first person <laughs> we hired was a, a storyteller, Layla. Yeah. So our, full, our first full-time storyteller, our first employee who's still with us today um, is a full-time storyteller, and we have multiple storytellers on staff because of that. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad you pushed back <laughs> because yeah. that's kind of what makes Chef special. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a question about something I saw on the platform which I thought was interesting, is sometimes I feel like you do a, like a chef of the month or a week or a day, I don't know what the mm -hmm. timeline is, yeah. and you sort of feature uh, folks. Um, what sort of prompts you to feature certain chefs and um, what is that kind of hoping to accomplish for you know, people who are on it for the first time or maybe yeah. repeat customers? Um, I think it goes back to two points. One, discoverability. Like, I think mm -hmm. a lot of folks don't know who they, they, they come on the platform and they have paralysis. There's all these things they've never heard of before. It's a lot of yeah, and they There's don't know what options. to try. And so, from a product standpoint, giving them a recommendation, we're trying to give them more recommendations and more insight into what's on the platform. Um, and so, it's, it's for that reason. And the second is, is for the chefs, right? I think a lot of chefs want to, we want to highlight their stories, one. And two, they want, you know, a lot of folks want to build their presence and their business on the platform, and we want to give them tools to do that, whether it's marketing tools or ways to be featured. And so um, for folks that are really excelling on the platform, we try to make, you know, experiences like that where they can be featured. Yeah. I mean, that totally makes sense. I went on Chef knowing that I wanted Pakistani food, and then I went on, and there were, for the first time in my life, so many Pakistani <laughs> options that I couldn't decide what I wanted yeah. to eat. Yeah. So that, uh, that is pretty special. Um, do you have a question? Yeah. So my name is Alejandra. I am actually an international student, so the idea of this, it's incredible for me as I miss my mom's and my grandma's yeah. food. So it's exciting. I will order like yeah. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to ask more regarding the packaging uh, waste and how is Chef like controlling this issue? And mm. like how do you see Chef different from DoorDash in this aspect? Yeah. That's a really good question. So, um, and Yogita probably, I don't know, you can chime in because she, she does all the packaging too. <laughs> but um, so we, if, hopefully you'll have the opportunity to order. If you're going to try, great. Um, by the way, we made a promo code for you, for you all so you can try Yogita's food. Nice. Edible 50. Okay. 50% off. We can put that um, up on the board yeah. <laughs> so that people have So that. everyone should order Yogita's food after this. <laughs> um, so we provide an insulated bag, and, and part of the reason for this is that we want to control the consumer experience and make sure it's safe, right? So this insulated bag we've tested repeatedly for various safety um, you know, conditions, timing, by market, and so um, we provide the red bag to our chefs. Um, the containers that go within, and then we have like certain labels, everything's labeled, and we provide the labels to chefs, they print them out and put them on. The containers are pre-approved containers that we know hold up under pressure. Um, most of those are recyclable plastic, but again, consumer feedback, it's true. Like we want to get to a more sustainable packaging solution. So we just did roll out um, eco-friendly packaging that's um, entirely biodegradable. Um, we don't, this is again, really important for us that we don't want to force our chefs to use it um, because they're ultimately providing their own packaging. And so if you go on our platform, you'll see um, if a chef has the new packaging, um, and again, we try to provide discounts where we can, like Restaurant Depot partnerships. We have a Uline partnership now, so they can have discounted pack packaging, but it still costs something to purchase. Um, and, and generally, the more compostable, biodegradable packaging is more expensive. So if a chef is using it, it'll say eco-friendly packaging on their profile. And so if you are a consumer who wants to support a chef who's doing that, then I recommend supporting that chef. Um, but you'll see it. We put it like front and center on the Explore page so you can see who's using that packaging. Amazing. Yeah. Did you want to add anything from the actual perspective of doing the packaging? Uh, yeah. I mean, um, one thing I wanted to add that the labels which we put on the food uh, containers are so clear with ingredients and reheating instructions. So, you know, you don't keep guessing how hmm. to reheat it or how to have it. Also, there will be um, garnishing or anything uh, which will be written in the note. Uh, mm -hmm. At least that's what I do, that 
uh, I write in a note that you should uh, put this as a garnishing and have it to enhance the taste. So that always helps the, from the consumer's uh, perspective. Oh. Also, I don't, you mentioned the, the, the written notes, something very special about the platform because again, for a lot of folks, this is, um, this is more than just you know, making food for people. This is a love language that they're sharing their food with yeah. you. And, and so a lot of folks do include written notes, which is very special as a consumer when you open up your package yeah. and you have a written yeah. note from Yogita in it. Um, and so, um, yeah, I encourage you to order. I think, I think you'll really enjoy the experience. You definitely will. <laughs> I just had Chef on Sunday, and it was amazing. It was That's a great cool. start to Ramadan, yeah, so it was awesome. really nice. Um, so I had another question around sort of um, thinking about, like, from, I guess, from your respective perspectives, but what have been sort of the biggest, um, and you've sort of touched on some of these, but what are the biggest challenges for you? I mean, from the perspective of a chef, so we've talked about a lot of the amazing things about being on here, but what I think is still, what's still difficult, and then obviously from a business perspective, I'm sure you could talk about many things that are challenges, so I would love to sort of hear that macro, micro perspective and how they kind of meet in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Challenges, um, yeah, still the uh, commercial platforms like, you know, DoorDash or the restaurants mm -hmm. are so much, um, is what you say, steeped in the, deep in the psychology of people that mm -hmm. trying homemade food seems like a little bit of challenge for them. Mm -hmm. And um, the more we, uh, what do you say, elaborate about different cuisines. So in the same, as you said, in India or in any country, this, the same country has multiple cuisines, which we are not exposed to. And I think that awareness uh, would be, would help this platform more. Yeah. Like, uh, then people will try more, uh, like different, multiple cuisines from the same country. And yeah, this would help. Um, I would say maybe two things. I think the consumer side, I think, is, I think you're right, more difficult to encourage people to try new things. And so on the product side, we are trying to build a lot of new ways to tell the stories of why people should care about cuisines they've never tried before. Um, and you know the funny part is once people try it, they love it, right? So um, I think we're we're trying to do a better job telling the stories of people like Yogita and why they should care. And and, um, and it is it is new and novel, right? Because people generally they they like to order what they know and what they're familiar with. Yeah. And so trying something new is difficult. Um, I'd say the second thing, just from a business standpoint, would just be hiring. Um, you know, I think this is a very difficult economy to be hiring folks in. Yeah. And as a mission-based company that, you know, we're competing against the DoorDashes and the Facebooks and the Googles and, you know, we can't pay the Facebook and the Google salaries, you know, right? Um, we're still an early company. And so, um, you know, fortunately, a lot of people who come to our company believe in the mission and, and they have their own personal story as to why food is important to them. Um, but, but I'm not, I'm not going to lie, we, we definitely have positions that have been open for, yeah. for six or 12 months and we're still struggling to, to fill yeah. them. Well, that's a plug for this class. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully folks are intrigued by Chef, and there's a lot of bright talent in this room, yeah. so yeah. hopefully that's. Um, I know we had some more student questions, so. Hi, my name is Katie. Thank you so much for speaking today. So I wanted to ask a little bit more about the name of Chef. So I noticed it's kind of a play on words with like she and then Chef together, and talking about like the amazing women that are part of this community. Um, could you just explain more about all the women who are on this platform and if they're able to have conversation with each other with their cooking mm -hmm. and kind of like if they're sharing cultures across with each other. Yeah, um, amazing question and something yeah. I forgot to mention, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Chef um, was named Chef as an homage to, to our mothers um, who obviously gave us so much um, love and food and nourishment growing up. And so, um, yeah, Alvin and I named the company Chef um, because of our mothers. Um, and as you guys know, as I mentioned, I, I really got into food after the passing of my mother. And so for me, I feel like everything I've done since the passing of my mother has kind of been for, for her. Um, in terms of how we connect folks, um, we, 
we're trying to do a lot more here. We actually just launched, uh, I think this week, um, we have an internal forum now. Um, it's not yeah. in the Bay Area yet. You've probably heard of it. So we want to encourage people. This kind of happens already when people are meeting at the Hub or informally. But we haven't actually had a space for people to ask questions, create conversations, connect with each other. And so we actually built on our back end a um, internal forum where chefs can communicate, share learnings. Um, there's so much knowledge to be shared, right? Like about how they scaled on the platform, menu optimizations, but also like. I don't know, just get to know each other and, and yeah. build the community. Um, and so that is actually launching this week in one market, and we're going to see how it goes and expand it. Um, we used to do more in-person things, but of course, then the pandemic happened, and we haven't yeah. been able to do anything in person for, for a while. Um, but we're hoping the digital hub will allow people to at least get to know each other. Um, we're also building a lot of stuff from consumer to chef, which I also yeah. up here about these. But there's going to be new ways that we don't currently have two-way chat, so there's going to be two-way chat. Uh -huh. And again, this is very intentional. A lot of platforms out there, food platforms, intentionally um, don't allow food entrepreneurs to communicate with their consumers. And because they, they, they want to prevent disintermediation, I get it, but like, we want our consumers to know our chefs, and we want our chefs to know their consumers. Mm -hmm. And so if they're going di to disintermediate, fine. Yeah. But like, they should be able to chat with them. Yeah. And so we're building stuff like that, and also ways that um, our chefs can send, right now they do handwritten notes, which is amazing, <laughs> but ways they can do audio messages and video messages with their orders Very and things cool. like this. Yeah. Very cool. We do have a meetups, but I mean, the chefs meet up uh, once in a month. Um, in like Bay Area chefs meet mm -hmm. uh, virtually uh, cool. once a month to share ideas, mm -hmm. to share more like, you know, knowledge about different cuisines or mm -hmm. Those things, but mm. it, it really helps mm. to get connected. What have been some of your learnings from these meetups? So uh, this time we tried uh, to make small groups and then find out new ideas to uh, develop your menu or uh, around uh, publicity, your uh, new dishes or new features. Uh, which will which would re help, really help Definitely. on the website. So yeah, it, it's really exciting. That's great. <laughs> it sounds super collaborative, which is also yeah. really nice yeah. and not as cutthroat. Um, Anna, and then yeah, you can go right after. Hi, I'm Viana, and first of all, thank you for sharing your view of food with all of us. Both of you, it's absolutely mesmerizing, and I wish more people kind of felt the same that you both do, so thank you for existing. So my question was about nutrition, and I was wondering how you can see Chef being a way to change the face of nutrition, because right now it's kale and quinoa, basically, when we know that like a lot of different cultures have very nutritious food that would kind of make it more enticing for people to want to eat nutritious rather than thinking they have to have a salad, as well as when forming your menu, kind of con nutritional considerations that you take. Great question. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, um, I try to uh, have the dishes which have nutritional value. Uh, I have not started mentioning yet the actual nutritional values in my dishes, but yes, I the the research, as I said, I'm more kind of a research person uh, due to my training. So yes, I am doing a research. Uh, how does it help uh, to? Uh, get more nutrition because it is already it is cooked in a safe environment uh, in a home kitchen with uh, as the same care as your mom or your grandmom will take so the the safe food how we will uh, we can make it more nutritional i mean you know with the i don't know the terminology, but you know, with protein, carbs, yeah. the counts. Yeah, I'm still doing that research. But uh, my approach or my goal is always to keep healthy and uh, nutritious food on my menu. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, this hits close to home for me because I you know, was diagnosed with high blood pressure when I was 19. And part of the reason was, I think, there are um, some of the ways that we think about nutrition have just not been true. And the reason I don't tell the backstory of that story, but I, I actually was really into working out. 
And so I was like on a no, no carb diet. Like I was eating protein. I, I thought that was healthy um, because I was looking at the macros, right? If you just look at the <laughs> macros, it looked very healthy. But the way I got all this protein and, and fat was through packaged meat. I was eating like four packages of turkey a day. Wow. Um, and obviously we know the sodium and nitrates that are going into these, these ingredients. Um, when you compare that to when you're, and, and, and you can just compare these like side by side. Like if you imagine something that's mass produced um, in a wholesale facility um, versus your mother making the same, you know, pad thai or lasagna, common dishes, it's made in an entirely different way. And it doesn't mean that you need to always be, I will say there, there are things on the chef platform that are not like something you should probably be eating every day. I ordered from a, ba uh, a baked good chef this week and I ordered a cake um, <laughs> and cookies, but I will say it is far higher quality cake yeah, than if yeah. I buy a cake at Safeway, right? Because um, she made it with love and care and, and I'm sure everyone knows the difference between a homemade meal and having a Safeway you know, meal where um, that I came from that industry and I think that the way that those meals are prepared, the ingredients that need to be acquired to mass produce, even when I did nutrition bars at scale, you can't buy high quality things because you need to buy, we were buying pallets of ingredients at a time and you need to buy them through a, bo a broker who gets them from a dis distributor, who gets from a co-op, from a farmer abroad. And because of that, there's just a lack of transparency and accountability in that food system. Whereas when Yogita's cooking for you, there's no lack of transparency. It's, you know, she's, she's right here and she's, she's being very transparent. Um, so, you know, all that's to say is like, I think that um, we are actually implementing a back end solution through a partner that will do nutrition labels for folks that want to implement it. But I think more than that, we don't want to say, hey, you can't do Brajol on the platform because Brajol, um, you know, it's close to our family. It's not something you want to eat every day, <laughs> but it's still healthier than getting it from a restaurant. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then I think we'll take one more question. Hi, uh, my name is Amanda. I just wanted to say thank you so much to both of you for being here. I was really excited when I first heard about Chef today because I come from a family of like immigrants and refugees who like order from their friends on WeChat and stuff like you were talking <laughs> right. about. And I think that they would really love this idea. So I kind of had two questions. The first one, um, I was curious about if there were any like particular barriers to entry for chefs who wanted to be on the platform. Like I know like you said that you wanted to limit the number just because of like how many people wanted, but like aside from that, what would you say the biggest barrier to entry would be? Mm. And the second one, I was kind of interested in how like your delivery system worked. Mm. Um, I know you mentioned that some chefs, um, like you would give them like industrial spaces where they could work. Mm. Um, and I was just wondering like, do the deliverers go like door to door to people's houses to like deliver um, or like to pick up the food and then deliver it? Or is there like a space where all the food is consolidated and then they like deliver yeah. it? Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Uh, so in terms of like getting onto the platform, um, no, anyone who applies, like our, our team will work with them and get them onboarded. Um, in terms of like what they need to do, it, it depends on the county and the state that they operate in. So we now operate across the country in most major um, cities. And so it does differ by where you're located. But the general process is the same, which Yogita went through too. It's, you know, we have, uh, we help you with your photos and your menu formulation and, um, and we have our own food and safety training and requirements. And then it differs a little bit by county and by state. Um, but ultimately there's, there's no real, we're not like holding back the floodgates on, on the wait list. We're onboarding as fast as we can. Um, and then in terms of how delivery works, it, it differs as well by market and by state. So certain states um, and counties have certain regulations around what um, delivery needs to look like, whether you can do pickup or you can't do pickup. Um, we do try to, where we can, consolidate orders at a local hub and redistribute them so that the chefs had a, a far larger reach. Because if we didn't do that, then Yogita can only you know, service maybe within five or 10 miles. And so where we can, we try to expand the reach through hubs um, and we have our own delivery drivers that will, that will do that. Um, but it really depends on the county and the state we're operating in. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so before we wrap up, I have one last question directed at Yogita. <laughs> um, what is your favorite dish that you currently make and, and share with uh, customers? And just describe like what it is and why you love it. The dish they should all order. Yes, tonight. exactly. Yeah. It's a little <laughs> plug for you. <laughs> so uh, there are two dishes. Okay, that's fine. I'll take two. Uh, one is uh, made of plantain. 
it's a stir-fried uh, plantain. And um, for me, it is uh, very close because my mother-in-law cooked it for the first time uh, when she came here for my daughter's first birthday. And it was amazing. I liked it since then, and I was trying out, uh, tried multiple recipes, and finally I got that. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, healthy. It looks healthy for me because uh, it's raw banana, the plantain, and it is just cooked and stir-fried in coconut oil. Um, it's a great side dish uh, mm. for anything, rice or chapati, roti, bread. <laughs> Another one is interesting, uh, which I was uh, sharing some time before, which my neighbor used to cook for me, uh, which is shave bhaji. It has a little bit story behind it that uh, when the farmers, when they used to have the harvest of, from the fields, all of them used to sit together and uh, cook it on the wood fire. They, they'll roast onion and garlic and coconut. And in India, many uh, states or every cuisine has some food which will be stored for a year. Mm. Like fried food or uh, pickles or anything. So one of the fried food will be chickpea uh, flour, uh, noodles made with chickpea flour, mm -hmm. which will be fried and kept to store to uh, last for some months. So the dish is very easy, uh, and that is why it is after harvest, because you have worked so, so much. Yeah. <laughs> People would just light a fire, roast things, grind, I mean, just Put the gra make a gravy and put that those noodles and have it. Mm. Authentically, it is too spicy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't make it. <laughs> I don't make it too spicy. But yes, um, it gives that um, you know fire to yeah. your tongue and um, it elevates your mood, uh, which you already have because you have such a good harvest. Amazing. So, yeah. That it's... sounds delicious. <laughs> wow. Well, join me in thanking both Joey and Yogita for being here. <laughs> I think we have some uh, chef converts, which was kind of my goal. So I'm glad <laughs> that, you know, people are, are learning the good message. I will turn it over to Pooja, who will wrap us up. And then um, we said the discount code was Edible 50. Okay, we'll send that out in, an, in our next update as well, so folks cool. remember. Yeah. Is that cool. just on, on your stuff? On anyone, but you should definitely order your <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll send a link. Yeah, cool. okay. <laughs> yeah, and her men, yeah, we can send a link to her menu yeah, as well. I found it while Cool. Uh, <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Good stuff. Cool. <laughs> yeah, this is just a photo of your food. <laughs> you can move on. I just, I just took this. This was, this was me being like, here, look at the food. <laughs> All right. Um, so just a couple of reminders before we wrap up. Um, next week, again, we don't have anything to submit as far, far as the final paper goes, but um, we do have a discussion uh, board post if you haven't done one of those yet. And again, uh, please do set up time during office hours with Will and I, uh, or Will or I. Um, or both, I guess, um, if you have questions. And we're happy to talk through that. Um, everyone's favorite part of the day, again, attendance. So on Slido, looking at this code. Um, okay. Um, and then next week, uh, our topic is, is kind of looking at comfort foods and thinking about how some of the, the foods that we love are being threatened by changes to um, our climate and uh, can just be approached differently in terms of, of who holds power. Um, so we had the founder of Red Bay Coffee, the founder of Voyage Foods, and founder of Firebrand Artisan Breads coming in, and it should be a great conversation. A couple questions?
You're right. You're totally right. There needs to be an EE in front of that. That is my bad. Um, yeah, so just EE 220406. Thank you for that. Yeah. Can we also have a big thank you for Sonia for being such a great host tonight? And we'll see you next week. I brought oranges again. These are the, probably the last of the naval oranges and we will be transitioning to Valencia next weekend. <laughs>